and realize that your word is real, it is powerful, that it is able to cut through every deception, every evil, every contraption of the enemy, so that Jesus is presented clearly, magnified, empowered before the whole world. Thank you, God, for being with us on this faith journey and for choosing to not forsake us at any point of the way. As we now go into your word, we plead, God, that your Holy Spirit will fill us and guide us. Please use us for your glory, dear God, we plead. Help us as we look at today's message that you have prepared for us. We plead, God, that you will magnify yourself in our midst and that we will look to you and live for that is the only way to make it through this wilderness sod. Thank you, Father, for the blessings you've prepared for us today. In Jesus' name we all pray. Amen. Welcome once again, friends, and uh, thank you. Uh, a blessed Sabbath to those who are on this side of, of, the, of the globe where it's still Sabbath. And a blessed new week to those who've already entered the new week in the Lord. And we just want to give God all the glory for the opportunities he gives us to commune with each other again and again and to recognize and appreciate that God is the one who's able to carry us along this, this great journey that he's put us on, perfecting our faith, that is his desire, perfecting our faith as we move onwards. Today's message is an important one, a message that needs our attention, a message that's entitled The Tap of Faith. And we want to talk about that today as we go into this message and we want to pray that God will lead us and instruct us as we study this very important subject matter with the Lord. So come with me, friends, and let us go right into our study. I'm going to share our screen so that we can all be up to speed. Let me see if I can get this right. Okay, I think that should work. All right, there we are. The Faith of Jesus, that's our series. If you've been with us, you know that we've been following that. Our theme text is found in Revelation 14, 12, that end time implication of this very important subject saying, here is the patience of the saints, the perseverance of the saints. And here are those that keep the commandments of God. They embrace, they, they hold close, they hold dear, they safeguard the commandments of God in their life, uphold the commandments of God in their life. And they're also preserving, embracing, upholding the faith of Jesus. This is spoken of the people living at the end stage of the world. We also look at this very inspired text uh, from Acts of the Apostles, page 254, where the prophet tells us if the apostle had at this time been compelled to leave Corinth, the converts to the faith of Jesus would have been placed in a perilous position. And we realize that God is ministering to us through that text, letting us know that we would like our faith, whatever we call as faith, to be converted to the very faith that Jesus has, that unshakable, immovable faith that Jesus has. He'd like us to have that experience. For today's study, we want to go back to the book of Judges. We want to look at an important character, a very well-known character, we want to start with Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 32 to introduce that character to us. In this hall of faith in Hebrews 11, his name is mentioned and we would like to just take a little bit of a closer look at his story. Hebrews 11:32 tells us, What more, what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon, who we looked at last time, of Barak, of Samson, of Jephthah, of David, of Samuel, and of the prophets. And friends, we could take a look at each of these characters and go even deeper. If you notice, we've looked at some characters from Hebrews 11, but we've not looked at all of them. For we could look at all of them and find beautiful lessons, and I encourage you to go there. In each of these characters that we've studied so far, you would realize we've not just learned the importance of having faith, but we're learning precious attributes of faith. We were studying last time are the hindrance to faith through the life of Gideon. So each of these faith heroes have unique aspects of faith to teach us about. So we can't let our eyes off of this very precious subject, especially knowing this is what will be required as we move in these last seasons of this Earth's history. Today we're going to take a look 
at an important figure who's mentioned here in Hebrews 11.32, whose name is Samson. Let's talk about that for a bit. The prophet tells us in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 560, she says, amid the widespread apostasy, the faithful worshipers of God continued to plead with him for the deliverance of Israel. Now, if you remember what we were studying last time, you would remember us speak about this, that God had called his people out of the land of Egypt, taken them through the wilderness journey, entered into the promised land. The challenge with the children of Israel was that now when they were in the promised land, they would be with God for a while and then they'd walk away from God. And when they'd walk away from God, the Lord will allow them to go into captivity. In captivity, as they're feeling the utter yoke and bondage of sin, they would cry out for deliverance. God would raise up a deliverer, deliver his people, and they would again go back to their old ways and end up in captivity again. And the cycle would continue. In captivity, they'd cry out. God would raise a deliverer. After deliverance, they'd go back to their old ways, and the cycle just went on. So it was a difficult time for the children of Israel. And that's what we see highlighted as we read that quote from Patriarchs and Prophet. Let's go back there and continue reading what the Prophet has in store for us. We read that even though there was widespread apostasy, the faithful worshippers of God, they continued to plead with him for the deliverance of Israel. Now notice this, though there was apparently no response, though year after year the power of the oppressor continued to rest more heavily upon the land, God's providence was preparing help for them. God wasn't turning a deaf ear to them. He was preparing help for them. Even in the early years of the Philistine oppression, a child was born through whom God designed to humble the power of these mighty foes. God was going to begin tearing down the Philistine empire through this manservant he was going to birth. Let's pick up the story in Judges 13, and it's an important narrative that we need to pay attention to, precious lessons there, and I want to emphasize this today. The children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord. So the Bible tells us the children of Israel did evil again, and as a result, the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Philistines for 40 years. This was a long, oppressive period. They ended up in the hands of the Philistines for 40 years. You can see the cycle. During that time, a certain man of Zorah, of the family of the Danites, whose name was Manoah, and his wife was barren and bare not. You know this part of the story. The angel of the Lord appeared unto the woman and said unto her, Behold, now thou art barren and bearest not, but thou shalt conceive and bear a son. So the angel of the Lord appears to, to Manoah's wife and says, You will bear a son. Now notice... The angel says, therefore, beware, I pray thee, drink not wine, nor strong drink, and eat not any unclean thing. This is odd. For lo, thou shalt conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come upon his head. For the child shall be a Nazarite unto God from the womb, and he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. It's odd. I'll tell you why. Because... Samson is to be avowed as a Nazarite. He will not allow a razor to come upon his head. It is Samson who will not eat any unclean thing, who will not drink any strong drink. This was required upon Samson. But notice what the angel of the Lord says to Samson's mother, Manoah's wife. Notice these important words. The angel of the Lord says to Manoah's wife, Samson's mom, Beware, I pray thee, drink not wine nor strong drink. Eat not any unclean thing. And you begin to wonder, wait, these were things that Samson was supposed to do. How come the angel is asking Manoah's wife to not drink or eat of such things? And you immediately realize the angel of the Lord God is giving a very, very precious lesson for all of human history. God has a precious message, especially for parents. He's saying to this mother, Mother, you don't want Samson to eat any unclean thing. 
And the way you can teach Samson to, to do that is by you yourself not eating any unclean thing. Mother, we don't want Samson to be drinking any strong drink. And the way you will teach your son to do that is when you yourself are not partaking of any strong drinks. He raises the bar, the Lord raises the bar for God, godly parenting by letting them know the way we direct our children is by allowing the Lord to direct our own lives first. In fact, notice what we read here uh, in Judges chapter 13. The Lord is making this appeal. And as he presents this appeal, he wants them to know this is of great, great, sincere importance. In fact, let me take a look at this. Uh, here's what the prophet says. God had an important work for the promised child of Manoah to do. And it was to secure for him the qualifications necessary for this work. The, the habits of both the mother and the child were to be carefully regulated. This is a very important subject matter, friends, to be considered. For the prophet tells us God had an important work for Samson. But to secure, it was to secure for him the qualifications necessary for the work to make the child more qualified, the parents had to be carefully regulated in their habits. Isn't that odd? Isn't that strange? We don't hear much of this being spoken. In order to prepare Samson for ministry, mother and father had to be completely surrendered, directed, and led by the Spirit of God. Their own lives were to be carefully regulated by the Lord if they wanted their children to be regulated under the Lord's hand. In fact, the prophet says, the mother is by the command of God himself placed under the most solemn obligation to exercise self-control. And fathers as well as mothers are involved in this responsibility. Wow. Both parents transmit their own characteristics, mental, physical, their dispositions, their appetites onwards to their children. As a result of parental intemperance, listen to this, as a result of parental intemperance, children often lack physical strength, mental, and moral power. Well, that's deep. Your morality has a direct bearing on your child's morality. Your physical strength, which is obvious from, from lessons on physiology, and your mental strength and, and prowess will directly affect. But wait, your moral power also has a direct effect on your child's moral stand in the Lord. The prophet says liquor drinkers and tobacco users may and do transmit their insatiable craving, their inflamed blood and irritable nerves to their children. The licentious often bequeath their unholy desires and even loathsome diseases as a legacy to their offspring. This is what they're passing on by not holding on to the Lord, by not allowing God to exercise self-control into their lives. As the children have less power to resist temptation than had the parents, the tendency is for each generation to fall lower and lower. To a great degree, parents are responsible not only for the violent passions and perverted appetites of their children, but for the infirmities of the thousands born deaf, blind, diseased, or idiotic. Wow, that sounds rough. And yet the truth, to a great degree, parents, by not safeguarding their own life in the Lord, pass on not a legacy or a heritage of righteousness, but a legacy of, 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 of deafness and blindness and disease and lack of moral strength. And all of these, friends, are, are the truths that God presents that he'd like us to pay attention to. Now, this is interesting because in speaking of Samson, Samson is called to be that child. And God desires that Samson maintains that physical strength, that spiritual strength. And where it starts is with the parents. Parents had to surrender their lives to God if they wanted their child to be surrendered to God. Now, here's the point, friends. Some perhaps would ask the question, but wait a minute. When we look at Samson's life, we see Manoah. 
and his wife. They were just wonderful people. In fact, let me let me quote this to you. This is this is really beautiful. Um, notice right after, right after the angel speaks to Manoah's wife, and asks her that you know you will conceive a child. We hear Manoah entreating the Lord and saying, "Oh my Lord, let the man of God which thou didst send come again unto us and teach us what we shall do unto the child that shall be born." And this is the part that's really humbling. And this is the part where I really have great appreciation for Manoah and his wife. So the angel comes and speaks to Manoah's wife. But Manoah says, it's good, Lord, you've spoken to, but I want you to please come again and instruct me also. As a father, I'd like to know how I should teach the child. Wait a minute, wait a minute. How I should teach the child that shall be future tense. A child that shall be born. The child is not born yet. But I want to request you, if you could please send this, this angel again so that I may know how to raise the child that is not born yet. And friends, the reason why that is so important, the reason why that is so important for us to focus on and dwell on is for the simple fact, friends, that Manoah and his wife were pleading with God on how to raise the child right even before the child was conceived, even before the child was born. Now, birth is a further apart. This child wasn't even conceived yet, and they were already pleading with God, please show us how this child should be reared, how this child should be nurtured. And that's mighty humbling. That's just mighty humbling. In fact, notice what the prophet says about that. Oh, this is so beautiful. This is so beautiful. Notice, notice, what, notice what the prophet says about Manoah's entreating to the Lord. Look at these words in Patriarchs and Prophets. Fearful that they should make some mistake in the important work committed to them, the husband prayed, let the man of God, which thou didst send, come again unto us and teach us what we shall do unto the child that shall be born. Wait. Fearful that they should make some mistake, in the important work committed to them, the husband prayed. Isn't it amazing, friends? What wonderful parents these were. They weren't concerned about so much of the financial security that the child will be born in or all the material wealth the child could possess. Their greater concern was to make sure that our child is not born outside of the guidance and outside of the leading of the Lord. That was their greater concern. Their desire was, Lord, how can we rear this child under the leading of the Lord, not under the leading of our desires, our plans, our thoughts. We want this child. We are. They were fearful to make a mistake in child rearing, that they wanted this child to be simply directly led by the Lord. Friends, there's so much to learn just from that, just from those initial passages. There's so much to learn what God would have us understand from Samson's life. Oftentimes, parents would like to see their children give their lives to the Lord completely, while themselves refusing to surrender their lives to the Lord. Many parents desiring that their children should serve the Lord when they themselves are not fully submitted to the service of the Lord. But perhaps there's another question that, that comes to mind, and that is, wait, but... Samson's parents, as, as revealed, so powerful. While many parents pray for their children after they've gone astray, after they've left the Lord, after they've walked out of the church, that's when they pray, please pray for my child so that they would come back. Samson's parents were praying for Samson even before he was conceived. What a powerful figure of faith that is presented to us. They didn't see this child, and yet they were fearful they would make a mistake in raising the child. So through the eyes of faith, they were pleading, teach us how to raise this child in the right manner. It's amazing. In fact, the prophet makes a point. If the husband and wife, this is, this is, this is, this is going to hit us hard. The prophet makes the point. If the husband and wife are not fully surrendered to the Lord, if they're not right with God in their relationship, it is a sin to increase the family. It is a sin to have a child, says the prophet. 
if husband and wife themselves are not right with the Lord, that's what they're going to pass on to their future generation. And it is a sin in God's sight to do that. But it goes deeper. You see, Samson is born. And again, you're asking the question. But, but, but look at them. They were so faithful. They were so close to the Lord. And Samson still turned out this way, as you know from Samson's story. He went out and he lived a, an adulterous life, a promiscuous life. And you're wondering, wait, but they were doing all the right things. How, how come this happened to them? And you realize, friends, that they had done their part. They had, they had introspected. They had surrendered their hearts to God, their lives to God. They were setting the right examples for, for Samson. But it was Samson. It was Samson who had hardened his heart. And after being taught the truth, it was Samson who had made up his mind to not follow the truth. So parents, you see, there's that dual role. There is that work that you do in setting the right example for your children. But at the end of your setting that example, children have to make the final decisions. Samson's parents did their part by surrendering themselves to the direction and the leading of the Lord. And now it was Samson's turn whether he was going to follow that leading or not. But what a, what a precious message that comes to us from there. We want to continue here as we speak about how God was, was leading Samson. And th this, this really, really gets beautiful. And I'd like us to pick this up in Judges 13 and verse 24, which was our, our key text read by our sister. Judges 13, 24 tells us, The woman bare a son and called his name Samson. And the child grew and the Lord blessed him. Beautiful. Look at the next verse. The spirit of the Lord began to move him at times in the camp of Dan between Zorah and Eshtal. The Bible says, as the man was growing, as, as Samson was growing, the spirit of the Lord, the Holy Spirit, began to move him at times in the camp of Dan between Zorah and Eshtal. Interestingly, friends, the word there, move, the Spirit of God moving Samson, the word there, move, in the Hebrew is the word pa'am. And pa'am really means to tap or to beat regularly, to beat sort of regularly, not, not, not sort of a beating, but to beat regularly, like a drum beat, like, like a regular beating. It's interesting that the Bible says the, that the child grew, the Lord blessed him, and as the child was growing, the spirit of the Lord began to tap him. The word moved, the word pa'am, meaning to tap or to beat regularly. The spirit of the Lord began to tap him at times. In the camp of Dan between Zora and Eshtal. And friends, there comes an important message running to you and me asking us to consider the reality of what that is. The Bible says the Spirit of the Lord began to tap Samson. The Spirit of the Lord began to move and began to get his attention, began to regularly beat upon his heart, saying, Samson, this is why you were born. Samson, this is the purpose for which you were created. Samson, you were created to bring deliverance upon the children of Israel. You were created to bring forth this marvelous gift that God has gifted you with. You were given all of this so that you, in all of this prowess, in all of this energy, in all of this strength, bring deliverance upon the people. You see, friends, in other words, if you look at the greater narrative of the book of Judges, as we looked at a little bit last week, Samson is a type, he is a picture, just as Gideon was a picture of the greater deliverer, Jesus Christ. Remember what Gideon did, if you still remember last week's story? Gideon had the 300, and he said to them, what I do, you should do the same. So Gideon himself broke the jar, broke the vessel, broke the, and the pitcher, and the light shone through. Just as Jesus who set the example of allowing his self to be denied, allowing himself to be broken so that the light of heaven could burst forth. He allowed his own body to be torn down, to be broken, to be nailed on the cross. And the light of that glorious gospel shone forth to the rest of the world. 
Dear friends, what a powerful message then that it comes to us as we look at Samson's life, because Samson also was brought onto the scene. Samson also was raised as a deliverer to be that reflection of Jesus, the mighty deliverer for the rest of Israel to see that Jesus is that deliverer who is coming to save his people from captivity. But it's a sad story, friends. Because time and time again, the Spirit of God was tapping him. He probably did not see it with his eyes, but it was the tap of faith reminding him, you need to not live by sight. As Samson was drawn again and again by his lustful ways, by his personal desires, his individual agendas, the Spirit of God was reminding him, Samson, this is not why you were created for. Samson, the tap came. You are not to live by, 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 by your own eyes. You are to live by faith. Samson, do not let your eyes draw you away from the Lord. Look to him through the eyes of faith and live for him, for this is why you were created. The Spirit of God kept tapping Samson and kept reminding him. Notice it doesn't say that the Spirit of God hit him in the head. The Bible doesn't say the Spirit of God threw him over. The Bible says the Spirit was gently tapping. It was the tap of faith moved Samson. Samson recognized you are alive for a purpose. Samson, don't defeat the grand purposes that God has for your life. Samson, don't overlook, don't, don't bring down, don't underestimate, don't downplay the great responsibility God has given to you. Dear friends, my question really today through this message, how are you dealing with the tap of the Holy Spirit in your lives? When the Spirit of God reminds you at each step of the way why we really exist, how are you responding to that tap of faith? How are you responding to the movings, the stirrings of the Holy Spirit, helping you recognize this is why you were created? How are we responding to the movings of the Holy Spirit in our daily lives? Samson wasn't paying attention. Friend, Samson wasn't paying attention. And the Bible tells us his eyes were constantly drawn to this and constantly drawn to that. His eyes would be drawn to this woman and then perhaps to another woman. And at one time, he comes to his parents and he says, I like that woman. She pleases me well. What he's saying is, I don't care whether, whether she's godly or not. I don't care whether she is, she is in a relationship with the Lord. But I like her. She pleases my eyes. And this is the danger, friends. And I want you to listen to this. The Spirit of God was tapping him to walk by faith. Understand the greater purpose that his eyes are not able to see. But his flesh was drawing him after his own eyes. Oh, live by what you see. Here's what's dangerous. As Samson desires that woman, his parents say, why don't you take a woman from your own tribe, from among God's people? No, I like that one because she pleases me well. She's looking good to me. She pleases my eyes. I need her. So he follows her eyes. He does not follow the tap of faith. He follows his eyes and guess how the story of Samson ends. He follows his eyes. At the end of the story, he has no eyes. It's a stirring account. What he followed, he lost. Followed his eyes. He lost his eyes. God had blessed him with the, with the reality that he was supposed to bring freedom. Freedom from captivity upon the land of Israel. And guess what happened to Samson instead? Samson misused his freedom. Samson abused his freedom. And the one who was called to set the captives free, he himself became a captive. You see, friends, if you remember when we were looking at Abraham's story, I don't know if I pointed it out, the prophet tells us, through Abraham's willing obedience to even sacrifice his own son, God was teaching the entire universe. Through Abraham, the universe was being instructed. Isn't that an amazing thought? I mean, that's mighty humbling to recognize. God was using a human to teach the entire universe what it means to live by faith. 
Samson was brought onto the scene to do the same. He was called to reflect the glorious nature of Jesus before the universe, before the days to come. And look at what happened instead. The one who, was came, who came to set the captives free, he himself ended up in captivity. He was given eyes, he misused his eyes. He was given freedom, he abused his freedom. And whatever he abused and misused are the very things that were taken away from him. Abused his eyes, lost his eyes. Abused his freedom, lost his freedom. Abused his strength, lost his strength, brothers and sisters. He had prostituted the gifts God had given unto him for his great glory. And friends, the question I ask today, the question I ask today, how are you using the gifts God has given to you? How is the gift that God has given into your hands being used to set the captives free from the bondage of sin to live free for the Lord? What you're abusing today, brothers and sisters, will very well be taken away from us. All that Samson took to abuse and prostitute for himself to please self was taken away from Samson. It's a tragic story. It's a tragic story. He, he gets into this deal. He, he finds his, his own best friend has cheated him and has gone out with his wife. His heart is so broken. He is deceived. He is he's just utterly devastated. And here's the thing, friends. It's not wrong. It's not wrong to be in that pit. It's not wrong to be thrown down and, and, and look at your life. Wow, this is a difficult situation. It's not wrong to be in that place. He wanted hope. He wanted rest. He was looking for where do I find a place where I can find rest because of what he was going through. And in this frustration, he ended up on the laps of Delilah. He was looking for rest and he found rest on the laps of Delilah. We know the story too well. And the story tells us, friends, you have to be careful where you go to find rest. For many a people, oh, I'm stressed today. Oh, because I'm stressed, I'm going to go out and watch a movie. I'm stressed today. I'll watch some comedy show that'll make me laugh and I'll feel better. I'm stressed today. Let me, let me get a shot of alcohol. I'm stressed today. Let me hear some worldly music. When we're, when we're troubled and we're looking for rest, we go to every other avenue rather than coming to the one who says, come to me and I will give you rest. Friends, you want to be careful where you go to find rest. It's not wrong to be tired. What's, what can devastatingly be wrong is where you go to find rest. Samson found rest, what he thought was rest, in the laps of Delilah. He knew Delilah is out to kill him, and yet he went there again and again. He went there again and again. And then one day when she was frustrated and, 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 and challenged, he's just, just disturbed. She's like, he's not telling me the truth. And when, he, when she finally pressured him, Samson ended up telling her the secret of his strength. He says, it's my hair. I've taken that Nazarite vow. She's, she whispers those sweet nothings in his ears, puts him to sleep. And as he goes to sleep, there enters the barber. There enters the barber. Enters in and shaves off the seven locks of hair that Samson had. Seven locks of hair that Samson had. He got up. And it's a devastating passage in the book of Judges. Samson got up thinking, thinking that the Lord is with me, but not knowing that the Lord had left him. Brothers and sisters, it's a scary story. When we walk by our eyes, but not by faith, when we walk pleasing self and not walk pleasing God, we think God is with us. And we become so incognizant to the fact we can't even recognize whether I am still walking with the Lord or not. We presume, we assume God is still with us, but he's left us. And because the reality is not that he walked away, reality is we walked away from him and left him standing there. That's Samson's story. He's lying there on the laps of Delilah and enters the barber. And shaves off the seven locks of his hair. 
Friends, this barber has been on the loose for the past 6,000 years or so. This barber has been on the loose and he's the same one who has devised and contracted and he has worked hard to, to shave off the locks of strength in all your past fathers and forefathers. This barber has come through India, he's, he's come through the United States, he's come through Sri Lanka and Burma, and this, this same barber has entered the shores of Australia as well. This barber is looking for a head he can shave. And if you let him close to you, if you end up on the wrong laps, this, this same barber shaves that lock called Bible study and you no longer enjoy Bible study. You spend some longer times on the laps of the devil. He shaves off a lock called prayer and you no longer have interest in prayer. You stay there a little bit longer. He wipes off and shaves off a lock called church and you no longer feel like coming to church. Brothers and sisters, the longer you stay on the laps of Delilah, the longer and more quicker the devil robs you and shaves away every last ounce of spiritual strength that God has given unto you. He gets up thinking he's got it all together, only to find out he's lost it all. He's lost it all. And then, friends, the, the unthinkable happens. All his life, the Spirit of God working with him, striving with him, and then he ends up in captivity. He is blinded. And it's a beautiful story. You think it's all over. But it's a beautiful story because Samson ends up in captivity. He's blinded. And when he was finally blinded to the world is when he was finally able to see God. As he sat there in captivity, tortured. As he sat there, he began to reflect. He began to reflect on how he had wasted his life. He began to reflect how he had abused and prostituted the gifts of the Holy Spirit. As his heart was torn, as he recognized what he had done to the Lord, the more he reflected, the more it led him to repentance. Reflection led to repentance. When he was blinded to the things of the world, that's when he could really see God finally. And there, there he was, crying out to God, saying, God, forgive me, but Lord, I want you to use me again, but look at me, I'm useless now. My strength is gone. I can be of no use to you. The one who came to set the captives free, he himself is a captive now. There is no way I could be of any use to you. But if there is some way, Lord, please, Will you use me just one more time? The one who had the one who had abused the gift of the Spirit, the one who had you abused the infilling of the Holy Spirit, is now pleading, Father, can you fill me with your spirit just one last time? And as Samson makes that plea, the children of the Philistines drag him out to make fun of him in the temple of Dagon. And as he's there, he asks the little boy, can you put my hands on the two pillars? He puts his hands and he prays a similar prayer like the thief on the cross when he prayed, Father, will you remember me just this once? Will you remember me just this once, this one last time? Will you please remember me? And as he presented that plea, as he presented that plea to the Lord, as he presented that request to the Lord for one last time, for one final work, the Holy Spirit possessed Samson again. Notice this, his, his life, the Lord had blessed him with the presence of the Holy Spirit. And for one last time, he was pleading, I need your spirit to see me through. Will you fill me one last time? I know I've wasted all these opportunities. Can you please give me one more opportunity? And the Bible tells us, friends, and I want to read this to you from Judges 13. And Judges, yeah, let me see if I, if I have it there. Let's take a look at it. Judges chapter 13. And notice what the Bible tells us, friends. In Judges, rather, rather, Judges 16 and verse 30, the Bible says, Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. 
He bowed himself with all his might, and the house fell upon the Lord and upon all the people that were therein. And now notice this. So the dead which he slew at his death were more than they which he slew in his life. That's a very important detail. Samson's last work was of greater, was a greater work than what he did in all his life. The dead which he slew at his death were more than they which he slew in his life. That's an important detail. Why, friends? Because notice, he had the gift of the Holy Spirit, and he was abusing that gift all along. Finally, in reflection and repentance, he turns to the Lord, and as he cries out for repentance, the Spirit comes and possesses him again. He had received the infilling of the Holy Spirit, abused it. But now the Holy Spirit came again in this latter time. You want to look at this as the picture of the end time scenario that's before us. This is not just an Old Testament story. Remember Paul in 1 Corinthians 10, 11 is saying, this is all written for God's people who are living at the end of the world. And in Samson's story, friends, we recognize, like many of God's people who have been abusing and, and prostituting the gifts of the Holy Spirit, who have been ignoring and busy disobeying and forsaking the gift of the Spirit of God. When calamities, struggles, brokenness, destitution comes upon their life, they will cry out to God. Looking at the grand narrative of human history, we know that soon, soon the judgments of God will be poured out specifically upon the cities to begin with in the spirit of prophecy known as the little time of trouble. Just before the great time of trouble, the seven last plagues. And as people's lives are being shaken, perhaps even in your own individual life, a loss of a loved one or the break of a relationship or some financial struggle that shakes the foundations of your life and you cry out to God as you reflect and realize, Lord, forgive me, I've wasted my life. All along I had been given the gift of the Holy Spirit, the early rain, and I've squandered it away. Father, will you please give me one more chance, one last chance to do one last work and the prophet tells his friends that the latter rain is more abundant than the early rain. And in Samson's story, we see that signified because Samson, in that latter outpouring of the Spirit on him, he was able to, to destroy more enemies than he did in his life. Reflection of what he had done led to repentance. Repentance led to the latter rain. Dear brothers and sisters, Samson's story is an appeal that if the Lord is tapping you today, if the Spirit of God is tapping you today, do not give in to the strokes of the barber, the devil, but give in to the tapping of the Holy Spirit who It is God's great desire that you and I live and we live for God's glory. That you and I breathe every day and move every day simply to magnify the Lord before the world. Dear brothers and sisters, the truth is, friends, we don't have to experience what Samson experienced. We don't have to end up in captivity. We don't have to be tortured by the enemy. We don't have to be mocked and scorned by the enemy. We can turn to the Lord now while we still can. We don't have to end up in a pig pen like the prodigal son before we realize in my father's house is abundance. We don't have to end up in the belly of a fish before we ask the Lord to deliver us. We don't have to be like the thief on the cross before we cry out for deliverance. Friends, we don't have to be blinded like Paul on the way to Damascus before we ask God to show us the way. Why don't we call upon him now? Why don't we give in to the, to the gentle leadings of the Holy Spirit, the tapping of faith, and say, Lord, take my life and let it be consecrated only to thee. Dear brothers and sisters, please let us not wait for the judgments of God to be poured upon us. 
Let us come to him now while we still can and allow him to use us in mighty, glorious ways that we will become reflections of Jesus to a broken and a destitute world. If it is your desire today, recognizing, yeah, I have been sensing the tapping of the Holy Spirit. I have been sensing the Lord leading me in a certain direction and I've stubbornly been rejecting it. But tonight I want to surrender my life to the Lord. Tonight I want to plead with the Lord, Lord, I've lived following my eyes. I don't want to end up like Samson with no eyes. Take me, Lord, while there is still time for me that I may be used and possessed completely by the Spirit of God. If that is your desire and if that's your prayer, if it's possible, if you're able, would you kneel with me, friends, as we close with a prayer? If you're able, please kneel with me as we pray. Dear yeah, Heavenly Father, thank you so much. So blessed to hear the story of Samson. The reality that God, there's a warning in the story of Samson to us. That if we keep abusing the gifts God has given to us, we don't realize we're walking away from the Lord and then still presuming that he's with us. But we don't realize we've walked away from him and left him behind. Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters. And Lord, I don't know what, what challenge, what difficulty they're in. And I know many times life gets them down and they end up frustrated and broken and they feel helpless. Lord, help them to know where to go to find rest. Help them not to end up in the wrong places to find rest. Let them come to Jesus who has promised eternal rest. Father, please help us to watch out for the barber who's busy shaving away the locks of spiritual strength. Help us to stay with you and keep our strength, our connection intact with Jesus. Father, I thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit who taps and beats regularly, repeatedly, perpetually. He's been pleading with us to give in, to surrender, to walk by faith and not by sight. Father, when we're tempted to, to do what, what, what looks to us is right, the Spirit reminds us, let us not do what looks right. Let us do what the Lord says is right. Help us to make decisions based on faith, not on sight. Help us to choose, not based on our eyes, but based on what the Spirit of God leads us to do. Father, bless your children today. Feed them your word. Empower them with your Spirit. Build them up in righteousness and prepare each and every one of them to one day stand face to face with thee. We thank you for these blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you.